Well, that concludes our investigation of the Z-transform for now. Let's just summarize some of the things that we have learned about it. We've learned that the Z-transform is really just an extension of the DTFT. We can take the Z-transform of a broader class of signals than we can with the DTFT. And if I have the Z-transform, I can get the DTFT out of it just by evaluating the Z-transform on the unit circle. So in some ways, the Z-transform contains the DTFT. This is just exactly what happened when we studied the Laplace transform. If I had the Laplace transform, I could actually get out the Fourier transform of a signal by evaluating the Laplace transform along the imaginary axis. Obviously, for both of these cases, to evaluate it at the set of points that you would like, whether that's the unit circle with the Z-transform or the imaginary axis with the Laplace transform, those points have to be in your region of convergence, otherwise things blow up. But as long as your region of convergence contains the unit circle, you can get the DTFT out of the Z-transform. We talked about the region of convergence quite a bit. This is just the point in the complex plane where your Z-transform is defined, and you always have to state what it is, otherwise your Z-transform does not uniquely determine the time domain signal. Sometimes you do explicitly state what the region of convergence is. You actually write down the magnitude of z greater than alpha or the magnitude of z less than alpha, something like that. And sometimes in problems you're actually explicitly given the region of convergence is, and they tell you exactly what it is. Other times though, they're a little trickier and they kind of imply what the region of convergence is. For instance, sometimes they tell you you're dealing with a causal system or some causal signal. Well that implicitly or tells you what the region of convergence is. We know if it's a causal signal, the region of convergence has to be outside of a circle. Or if we're dealing with a stable system, that means that the um, region of convergence has to include the unit circle, because it's only for stable systems that have absolutely summable impulse responses that we will have the unit circle in the region of convergence. So sometimes the region of convergence is explicitly stated. Sometimes there's these clue words that you have to look out to be able to understand what the region of convergence is. The properties of the Z-transform are all very similar to properties of the Fourier transform. The only real difference is that as you use the properties, you also have to keep track of the region of convergence. Often the region of convergence changes. Sometimes it turns into the intersection of two different sets of the complex plane. Sometimes it rotates or shrinks, but you have to keep track of that region of convergence as you apply your different Z-transform properties. We know that a discrete time system can be completely characterized by its transfer function. So if you give me its impulse response, I can take the Z-transform, and by examining the Z-transform, I know just about everything that I want to know about the system. The H of Z and H of K are these Z-transform pairs. We know that the exponential signal Z to the K is an eigenfunction of a discrete time LTI system. This means that if I put Z to the K into my system, what comes out is Z to the K, only it's been modified by this complex number, h of z. So in terms of inputs, what went in is exactly what comes out. It's just been changed by a single complex number, h of z. We introduced this concept of the unilateral z-transform, and that's kind of a convenience. We could just do the bilateral z-transform all the time if we wanted, but since most input signals we deal with and most practical systems that we deal with are right-sided signals, you know, something starts now and goes to the right, it's very useful to use the unilateral Z-transform and not worry about the region of convergence as much, just know that it will be outside of some circle. And then we also talked about how we can use the unilateral Z-transform to solve difference equations. We can take a difference equation, which is a description of a discrete time, linear time invariant system in the time domain, go into the Z-domain using our time shift properties of the UZT, and then solve algebraically in the Z-domain for the quantity that we want. So solving difference equations with some type of initial conditions, the best way to do that now, I think, is to use the unilateral Z-transform. And that sums up kind of the key things that we have learned about the Z-transform and how you can use it to do system and signal analysis of discrete time signals and discrete time systems.